And while the boy Holston was mooning over his fireflies at Fiosol, a certain professor of physics named Rufus was giving a course of afternoon lectures upon radium and radioactivity in Edinburgh. They were lectures that had attracted a very considerable amount of attention. He gave them in a small lecture theater that had become more and more congested as his course proceeded. At his concluding discussion, it was crowded right up to the ceiling at the back, and there people were standing, standing without any sense of fatigue, so fascinating did they find his suggestions. One youngster in particular, a chuckle-headed, scrub-haired lad from the Highlands, sat hugging his knee with great sand-red hands and drinking in every word, eyes aglow, cheeks flushed, and ears burning. And so, said the professor, we see that this radium, which seemed at first a fantastic exception, a mad inversion of all that was most established and fundamental in the constitution of matter, is really at one with the rest of the elements. It does noticeably and forcibly what probably all the other elements are doing with an imperceptible slowness. It is like the single voice crying aloud that betrays the silent breathing multitude in the darkness. Radium is an element that is breaking up and flying to pieces, but perhaps all elements are doing thus at less perceptible rates. Uranium certainly is. Thorium, the stuff of this incandescent glass mantle, certainly is. Actinium? I feel we are but beginning the list, and we know now that the atom, that once we thought hard and impenetrable, and indivisible, and final, and lifeless, lifeless, is really a reservoir of immense energy. That is the most wonderful thing about all this work. A little while ago we thought of the atoms as we thought of bricks, as solid building material, as substantial matter, as unit masses of lifeless stuff, and behold, these bricks are boxes, treasure boxes, boxes full of the intensest force. This little bottle contains about a pint of uranium oxide, that is to say, about 14 ounces of the element uranium. It is worth about a pound. And in this bottle, ladies and gentlemen, in the atoms in this bottle, there slumbers at least as much energy as we could get by burning a hundred and sixty tons of coal. If, at a word, in one instant, I could suddenly release that energy here and now, it would blow us and everything about us to fragments. If I could turn it into the machinery that lights this city, it could keep Edinburgh brightly lit for a week. But at present, no man knows. No man has an inkling of how this little lump of stuff can be made to hasten the release of its store. It does release it, as a burn trickles. Slowly, the uranium changes into radium, the radium changes into a gas called the radium emanation, and that again to what we call radium A, and so the process goes on, giving out energy at every stage, until at last we reach the last stage of all, which is, so far as we can tell at present, lead. But we cannot hasten it. I take ye, man, whispered the chuckle-headed lad, with his red hands tightening like a vice upon his knee. I take ye, man. Go on. Oh, go on. The professor went on after a little pause. Why is the change gradual? he asked. Why does only a minute fraction of the radium disintegrate in any particular second? Why does it dole itself out so slowly and so exactly? Why does not all the uranium change to radium and all the radium change to the next lowest thing at once? Why this decay by driblets? Why not a decay en masse? Suppose presently we find it is possible to quicken that decay. The chuckle-headed lad nodded rapidly. The wonderful, inevitable idea was coming. He drew his knee up toward his chin and swayed in his seat with excitement. Why not? he echoed. Why not? The professor lifted his forefinger. Given that knowledge, he said, 
Mark what we should be able to do. We should not only be able to use this uranium and thorium, not only should we have a source of power so potent that a man might carry in his hand the energy to light a city for a year, fight a fleet of battleships, or drive one of our giant liners across the Atlantic, but we should also have a clue that would enable us, at last, to quicken the process of disintegration in all the other elements, where decay is still so slow as to escape our finest measurements. Every scrap of solid matter in the world would become an available reservoir of concentrated force. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, what these things would mean for us? The scrubhead nodded. Oh, go on! Go on! It would mean a change in human conditions that I can only compare to the discovery of fire, that first discovery that lifted man above the brute. We stand today towards radioactivity as our ancestor stood towards fire before he had learned to make it. He knew it then only as a strange thing utterly beyond his control, a flare on the crest of the volcano, a red destruction that poured through the forest. So it is that we know radioactivity today. This, this is the dawn of a new day in human living, at the climax of that civilization which had its beginning in the hammered flint and the fire stick of the savage, just when it is becoming apparent that our ever-increasing needs cannot be borne indefinitely by our present sources of energy, we discover suddenly the possibility of an entirely new civilization. The energy we need for our very existence, and with which nature supplies us still so grudgingly, is, in reality, locked up in inconceivable quantities all about us. We cannot pick that lock at present, but... He paused, his voice sank so that everybody strained a little to hear him. We will. This is Fractopia, forecasting the facts of tomorrow in the fiction of today. I'm your host, Todd Foley, and in today's episode, we'll be taking a look at the uses of science fiction as a predictive mechanism, enabling us to see our way toward a better future and avoid the pitfalls that may beset us on our collective journey into tomorrow. I think that uh, today science fiction is the most important artistic genre. It shapes the understanding of the public uh, of things like artificial intelligence and biotechnology, which are likely to change our life and to change society more than anything else in the coming decades. Uh, so I think science fiction has a real political and social responsibility today. That's writer and historian Yuval Noah Harari, who recently appeared on Wired magazine's Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast, to talk about his latest book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. In the interview, Harari speaks about the importance of science fiction as a sort of future-casting tool, and proposes a number of fascinating science fiction plots for writers to take up as a challenge, illuminating some of the most interesting and controversial developments that will be coming our way in the next few decades. It is extremely important still to have articles in Science and Nature, of course, but in order to inform the public and to have a, a good political debate, uh, we, the, most people will not read those articles. And science fiction movies and novels are the main, um, the, the main genre that shapes people's understanding of these developments. So this is why I think they are so important. There's no doubt that science fiction writers have often envisioned developments far ahead of their time, but just as often, if not more so, the genre has been used as a form of escapism, reveling in stories about alien invasions, interdimensional travel, and robots taking over the world. Certainly these stories are fun to read, and a little escapism can be a good thing, but Harari sees a more constructive role for the genre to play in these chaotic times, enabling us to imagine the possible repercussions of today's most disruptive technologies on human life, politics and culture, even morality. Well, you know, science fiction can certainly uh, teach people ethics and teach people how to behave. A lot of science fiction is really a morality play. 
to give the, this the, the 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 obvious example of Star Trek. So every episode in Star Trek is this liberal morality play mm. about how should we respect diversity and and, and whatever. So uh, it, it's it's definitely possible to convey moral lessons through science fiction and through all kinds of fictions. The key aspect of such predictive science fiction, it would seem, is keeping it real. In 2004, at the Clarion West Writers' Workshop, author Jeff Ryman coined the phrase mundane science fiction, the tenets of which were later codified in a document called The Mundane Manifesto. Ryman and his colleagues were tired of the bug-eyed monsters and adolescent fantasy that permeated so much of the genre, and they sought to do something about it. According to Barnes & Noble, mundane science fiction is a literary movement that seeks to rein in the fiction part of SF and promote the science part more. Rather than make stories less exciting, mundane sci-fi can generate incredible narratives that feel more powerful because of their probability. Writers who wish to inject a more realistic understanding of science into their works might want to bookmark the website of author Dan Cobalt, who does a weekly series called Science in Sci-Fi, Fact in Fantasy. Each week, Cobalt looks at one particular topic, explaining the scientific reasoning and technical details with the help of professors, technologists, inventors, and academics. This condensed background information can be a great help to the writer who wants to bring a level of mundanity to their fiction. It has often been pointed out that science fiction writers have a pretty dismal track record when it comes to literally predicting future events. And while that's definitely true, it can't be argued that good science fiction has the ability to influence future developments in important ways. In his 1914 novel, The World Set Free, an excerpt of which you heard at the top of this episode, H.G. Wells predicted the development of both atomic power and the atomic bomb. The first open ocean submarine was invented by Simon Lake after becoming intrigued by the Nautilus in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the Star Trek communicator inspired Martin Cooper, then director of research and development at Motorola, to develop the world's first mobile phone. And the list goes on. Over at printerinks.com, you can download an infographic including several dozen examples of inventions that were accurately predicted or influenced by previously published science fiction works. You'll find the link in the show notes below. Because the mundane science fiction movement aims for less fiction and more science, their output tends to lean toward the crunchy edge of hard SF. As we've seen, the predictions of these writers can indeed have a formative influence on subsequent inventions and technological developments. But it's just as important to consider cultural shifts and the human condition. And writers of Fractopian fiction concentrate just as keenly on these issues, making these works fall closer to the category of social science fiction than hard SF. Technology and culture are always engaged in a two-way feedback loop. It's impossible to imagine advances in one without considering its effects on the other. This feedback loop between technology and culture is one that's taken very seriously by the folks at Scout, a startup company and online think tank based in Seattle. Scout is a community of scientists, technologists, writers, and strategic foresight experts who use science fiction to create scenarios for technologists, politicians, and CEOs. On a monthly basis, they publish original research, 
in-depth analysis, and stories that evaluate the near-term implications of specific technologies, including all the attendant opportunities and risks. It's an intentional community, grown by invitation only, and its ranks include science fiction authors Madeline Ashby, Greg Baer, Brenda Cooper, and David Brin, who's fond of pointing out that the highest form of science fiction is not the successful prophecy, it's the successful self-preventing prophecy. Scout CEO Barrett Anderson got the idea for the project while working on the Future in Review Tech Conference, which introduced her to many people who were thinking along these forward-looking lines. Working with that group of people over such a long time, people like you know Elon Musk and Ben Cerf and Vinod Khosla, I really saw how strategic foresight and science fiction impacted and, and shaped their worldview. Um, and not just you know how they think about the future, but also a lot of science fiction creates kind of a blueprint for some of the world's top technologists and CEOs. The iPhone, for example, first existed on Star Trek, right? And so it kind of creates this mental model, this mental blueprint that allows people to build towards the things, uh, to really build the technologies that, that exist in, in science fiction. So seeing how closely this was being used by, by this very high level group of technologists, I, I wanted to bring that kind of foresight and strategic thinking to a broader community in the tech world. It's kind of like this combined analysis and science fiction brainstorm where we think about all of the possible futures of that specific technology and like what are all of the possible implications of a specific technology. And then we work with freelance writers and editors to you know go out and write a real piece of analysis and investigative reporting on that and then also the science fiction authors, right? So they're working on, we, we come up with some ideas like possible science fiction stories or angles that would be interesting to explore. And then we meet with them and they often have ideas. And so we have, we kind of have an interchange of ideas. And it's not just technologists who pay attention to this stuff. As Anderson points out, President Reagan's staff received weekly briefings from a cadre of science fiction writers during his administration. And this keen interest in science fiction scenarios continues in Washington to this day. So the FBI and the CIA, um, the military have been working with science fiction authors and strategic foresight experts for years to help them figure out where is the world headed and, and what are the kind of big problems coming up in the future that we need to be ready for and we need to be prepared for. Because the technological and societal landscape changes so quickly, the folks at Scout focus on the very near future, looking at a limited set of issues and projecting their scenarios no more than 10 years ahead. What we're trying to do is to use our imagination and to help our, our members and our readers understand how to use your imagination as a strategic tool. Because the thing that the tech industry most often misses is not just how technology will affect the world, but how the world will respond to technology. You can learn more about Scout and request membership to their growing community at scout.ai. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting against the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. This might be a motto for the folks at Team Human. Team Human is a podcast and salon series led by the well-known author and media theorist Douglas Rushkoff. On their website, Rushkoff explains that Team Human is striving to amplify human connections. Each week, says Rushkoff, we are engaging in real-time, no-holds-barred discussions with people who are hacking the machine to make it more compatible with human life and helping redefine what it means to stay human in a digital age. You know, what I'm trying to do, and what I am imploring everyone to do, is to stop thinking of the future as a noun, the future, but think of the future as a verb. The future, we can future together. I mean, really, every verb is the future. Every verb, everything that you are doing right now is making the future. We are responsible for the future. This is the future. And it's something we do together, and we can only do together. You can't make the future by yourself. You can escape the future by yourself, or try to, or think you can. But we make the future together. And that's why I'm, I'm pushing this new meme of Team Human. 
The visions entertained by Team Human may often tend toward the prescriptive, but we can learn just as much from those that are proscriptive. Just like a good dystopian tale, there's a lesson to be learned in what to avoid, as well as what to move toward. Here's Rushkoff interviewing author Pat Cadigan for Team Human episode 94, which was held at the Virtual Futures Salon in London on July 9th, 2018. You've talked in the past about your, your choice of what kind of science fiction to write. You know, and not to write these kind of super futuristic, you know, escape from the planet and colonize Mars sorts of stuff, but to look right around the corner at the near, at the near future. And I suppose people say that that's what makes it cyberpunk, but to me that also makes it political. It makes it more about sort of influencing the direction that we're going or warning us about some of the directions that we're going rather than just fantasizing about something. I'm, I'm interested that in, in not to give away the secrets of the trade, but your your kind of your speculative process. You know, when you're looking at it's not future casting, but when you're looking at something in the near future, at, at about writing about that, are are you kind of looking at existing technology and their biases, and then kind of thinking, well, if we keep moving that way, it's going to be like this, or are you looking at sort of human beings and their desires and thinking what? kinds of things would they make to fulfill them? I mean, sort of what, what road is, are you following? Well, actually, since you ask, I'm looking at it like your mother. And your mother is saying, that's gonna bite you in the ass. Mm. And you know, it's like, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, I'm looking at all the things that could go right and all the things that could go wrong and I'm afraid uh, Murphy's Law usually rules. It's important to consider both the prescriptive and the proscriptive, to envision the nightmare scenarios that new technologies might unleash upon us, and at the same time, to plant the seeds of future developments that will make life better for everyone on board spaceship Earth. Near-future science fiction writers need not only take into account the glorious possibilities afforded by new technologies by creating positive examples, but also to indicate paths toward a future which avoids potential calamity and dystopian outcomes, such as Orwell's 1984, by creating negative examples. Once again, Here's Yuval Harari. So there are many in these kind of, uh, uh, again, science fiction scenarios which never materialize because society can take action to protect itself and to regulate the dangerous technologies. And this is very important to remember as we look to the future. We've been talking for the last hour about all kinds of dystopian visions of how AI and bioengineering could be used to create all kinds of very frightening scenarios. But none of that is inevitable. We can still take action and we can still regulate these technologies to prevent the worst case scenarios and to use this, these technologies mainly for good. In the words of Doug Rushkoff, being human is a team sport and Team Human welcomes your participation. You can find this episode and many other illuminating episodes at teamhuman.fm. There's no doubt that I want Team Human to succeed, both in the locally limited sense of Rushkoff's podcast and the broad general sense of the entire human race. But there's also no denying that we humans always tend to complicate things. This is a point of view expressed by the authors of Fractopian Fiction that despite our best efforts, or even because of them, tomorrow's digitally augmented world will be just as stratified and heterodox, if not more so, than today. A similar position is held by science fiction writer Stefan Oram, who writes contemporary dystopian fiction set in a recognizable near future. Oram is now heading up the Future Fictions project for Virtual Futures, 
now in its fourth year. Those of you who follow the Fractopia channel on YouTube may remember that I mentioned the Future Fictions Project a couple weeks ago. In his recent call for submissions to the series, deadline December 2, 2018, Aurum puts it this way. We are looking for stories of the near future in which we can see our world, ourselves, and the potential implications or applications of technology currently being used, developed, or researched. Avoid cliché. Sci-fi is often the victim of the binary between utopia and dystopia. Fiction in which all of our problems are fixed or created by a specific technology or technologies. In reality, our relationship with our technology never follows these simple categories. It is frequently a messier affair. All of which leads us back to Fractopian fiction. It's a genre which some have been tempted to view as a subset of cyberpunk, but let's be pragmatic here. If the term cyberpunk covered the same ground, we wouldn't need to use another term. It might be easiest to illustrate what Fractopian fiction is by pointing out what it isn't. It isn't cyberpunk. It isn't solar punk. It isn't utopian and it isn't dystopian. All of those things are too categorical, too ideological, too all of a piece to encompass the diversity and subtlety of the Fractopian worldview. In that worldview, we see a highly stratified capitalist culture, rich in ambient technological intelligence, augmented reality, pervasive AI and robotics, ubiquitous advertising, corporate governance, and green technologies, with new economic systems such as universal basic income operating as a bulwark against job automation, along with new forms of economic and social disparity, and an ever-shifting gig economy working alongside the remaining traditional forms of white-collar labor. Fractopian authors are attempting to write speculative literature in a world much like our own, but that just happens to be situated in our future. Like all forms of metamodernism, their work is at times ironic and at times sincere, and while it strives for technological realism, it is more interested in the effects of convergent technologies on human life and society than with technology for its own sake. In short, the Fractopian world is fragmented, diverse, multi-layered, and troubled, just like the real world today. Ontologically, it posits multiple realities existing side by side. Politically, it admits both capitalist realism and socialized solutions to many of today's cultural issues. Within the Fractopian world, one could easily see either a dawning utopia or a looming dystopia just around the corner depending on where one stands. And just like our own world today, it teeters on a knife edge between the two. Whatever your choice of subgenre or style, there's never been a more important time for science fiction writers to present their best work. From the rainy, neon-lit streets of cyberpunk to the post-scarcity visions of radical solarpunk, from ominous dystopian nightmares to altruistic utopian visions, from the hard-edged science of mundane SF to the humanist concerns of social SF and the wide range of fractopian visions that lie between them. Science fiction as a genre has never been as approachable from a mainstream standpoint, never as popular or accessible as it is today. And that's not without reason. For while future events may be impossible to predict, today's science fiction authors yet have a chance, even a responsibility, to leverage their concepts into public awareness, to inspire us, to warn us, and just maybe, to influence the very future of civilization.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Fractopia. I'm your host, Todd Foley, reminding you to comment, like, subscribe, and share as feeding those important algorithms will help bring the show to a broader audience of futurists and fictioneers. If you're feeling especially warm and fuzzy, please feel free to show your support by dropping a one-time donation at thisisfractopia.com or joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash fractopia. Patrons get special perks like subscriber-only videos and long-form interviews, glimpses behind the scenes, topical polls and surveys, and invitations to participate in subscriber-only events online. If you have any ideas, suggestions, or questions, or if you're a writer of near-future fiction and would like to see your work featured in this podcast or on the website at thisisfractopia.com, please feel free to comment below or contact me via the channel of your choice. I'm always interested in conversations on these topics, and I enjoy promoting work that gives people more to think about when it comes to the foreseeable future. As always, sources and links for further reading can be found in the show notes below.